Yeah, dude. So the reason I asked you to to join me is because I'm really interested to hear some of your expertise and uh, insights around narcissism. Mm-hmm. And and before we get into some of my like specific questions, could we kind of paint the context of what being what a narcissist is? and maybe kind of what it feels like to be involved with someone who's narcissistic or what it feels like to be a narcissist if the, yeah. <laughs> if that's more fit. Well, I can't I can't yeah I can't um I mean I can describe what it might feel like you know from what uh for, you know what it feels like. I'm not you know um you know I'm not a di- diagnosed narcissist or anything like that so I can't describe what it feels like but I can <laughs> talk to people about what I definitely can talk to people about what it feels like to be with one in an intimate relationship or you know, the experience that people have if they have, because um, a, lot, a lot of times people talk about it from the context of a romantic relationship, and then people forget that they're in our everyday life. Sometimes they might be a coworker, it could be a boss, it could be a sibling or a mother or a father, uh, it could be a friend. Uh, and, uh, and it can look very differently uh, in each and every single situation. So um, to kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, shortcut a little bit about what you're asking. Uh, first, first and foremost, narcissism is on a spectrum. Um, there's a lot, a lot of false and a, b- a lot of bad information out there, on, especially on social media when it comes to narcissism, uh, almost to a point where people paint narcissism as if it's a black and white issue. Either you are or are not a narcissist, where in reality, Literally every single one of us have narcissistic traits, have narcissistic qualities uh, about us. Um, So typically when people ask about narcissism, they're asking about narcissistic personality disorder or what people call NPD. Um, I'm going to get into that in a second. I'm going to talk about the, the spectrum of narcissism because as I talk about narcissistic personality disorder, a lot of people are probably going to listen to this and like, oh, I do that. Maybe I'm a narcissist. And, that, and that's very, very common for people to do. Um, so narcissism, the health, let's say call it the healthy version of narcissism. We all, every single one of us, you and I all need it. It's actually a need that we all have. Why do we need it? A lot of people are like, why would I need narcissism? That, that sounds so mean and so cruel and things that, things of that nature. Well, if you really think about it, if you go through a bad situation, let's say that you get really sick, let's say that you um, lose a job, you lose a loved one, there's a point in time where you actually need to need your healthy, healthy version of narcissism. You need everything to be all about you for a period of time until you get back on your feet. If mm-hmm. you break your leg, you know, God forbid, in any of those type of things, you do need the world to be kind of centered around you to you need help from other people. You do need to uh, ask other, you know, uh, and for a lot of people that might even feel uncomfortable because they're so used to being, being helpful. And most people, great majority of the people, once you do get back on your feet, you tend to kind of even, uh, even back out. Uh, You start to realize, you know, Hey, you start to thank people, right? There's typically a level of appreciation, Mm -hmm. um, a level of gratitude. You typically might, you know, give back to the other person. Um, and, uh, and, and you kind of acknowledge that, you know, yeah, I, I needed people, you know, at this time. Well, people who struggle with narcissistic personality disorder, they, uh, it's like that all the time. Hmm. Everything is all about them all the time. And uh, I think that, is, you know, that's a very, very, that's kind of a very generic way to explain it. Because, but when, you know, even with, within narcissistic personality disorder, we have, we have different types of narcissists. We have uh, what's called the classic narcissist, the, the, what you see people call, consider the grandiose narcissist. Um, this person is going to come across as someone who is a lot more bullish, um, someone who... Um, this type of narcissist, you typically can see this person coming a mile, coming from a mile away. You know, has to be the center of attention. Kind of like then a, we have, kind of like ahead. kind of like a Donald Trump character. Yep, yeah, mm-hmm, yep. Yeah. And so then we also have like uh, you know what's considered more of a covert narcissist, where they might be kind of a little bit more laid back, a lot a lot more, <clears throat> um, hmm. a lot more. Um, 
I mean, definitely covert, but um, they might come across as more meek or more vulnerable. Covert, me- you covert know? means um, like uh, undercover, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's like an undercover. So uh, <laughs> I, what I what I like to what I like to describe well, the way that I like to describe covert narcissists is that they like to create drama, and then uh, they sit back and watch the entire uh, watch the drama unfold. So then then they're they're not the, the center of it. Uh, whereas the 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 classic narcissist, the grandiose narcissist, they want to create it, and they want you to know that they're the ones that created it, and mm. that they're the they're the ones that, that are at the center of it. So um, if if somebody's just so I can make sure I'm hanging on with you here, if somebody is, uh, you know, undercover narcissist, right? They're yeah. covert mm-hmm. narcissist. Then they want to yeah. create the drama and then step back and watch it all happen. Yeah. How is it still about them? They get so narcissist. <clears throat> Narcissists, um, they feed off of what people call supply, right? They like having control over other people. And if you think about it, if I can create drama and if I can, if mm. I can create drama and I can create havoc and I mm. get to, it's almost like watching a TV show that you have control over. Uh, okay. Right. So, um, imagine, uh, just to give you an example. This is something that's very common. People who are listening to this might probably have experienced this where, um, you, you know, you have a person that you're having conflict with, and then they try to gaslight you. What's wrong with you? You know, you need to be on medication. There must be something wrong, you know, uh, trying to convince you that there has to be something wrong with you because you haven't, you have a disagreement. Yeah. Well, instead of there just being a disagreement, they go to your friends and your family member. You need to check on Braxton. I don't know what's going on with him. Don't tell him that I came to you, Yeah. you know, but uh, I think he's depressed. He's, you know, he, he, even if these things are not true, you know, uh, you know, he's just, um, you know, crying all the time. He's, you know, and just making up sometimes fictitious things or half truths or outright lies. And so then, so you have this person that is typically very close to you telling you there's something wrong with you. You need medication. You need to see someone, uh, even though you feel fine, you just have a disagreement. And then you go to a close, another close friend and they're like, Hey, is everything okay? And you're like, yeah, why? I don't know. You just, something seems off. And then you go to another person. And they, you don't, you don't realize that, that covert narcissist has gone to that person. Hey, is everything okay? And before you know it, four people are asking you if you're okay, and you're starting to literally question yourself. Hmm. And this is where ga- this is what tr- true gaslighting actually is. It's crazy making, right? It makes you you start to wonder, like, well, maybe I'm not okay. Like, maybe everyone else is noticing something that I'm not seeing in myself. Like, I feel fine, but it, maybe I am crazy. Maybe I am losing it. Hmm. And this is where it starts to really start to unravel, where you start to really start to question your own reality. Because in that case, you have someone who's kind of campaigning on your downfall. They're they're going around sharing. That's interesting that yeah. both of them are kind of operating from a lack of power, right? Or, or the de- the mm-hmm. need to feel powerful. One is yeah. is making sure that you see them as God, and one is kind of playing the insidious, secretive devil of sorts. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's pretty interesting, man. So, okay, when we, how can we begin to identify when someone's really f- high on the spectrum of narcissism and, and begin to like position ourselves in a healthy way to not get lost in the sauce of just horrible, you know, uh, like the worst version of ourselves in relationship, you know, like you said, it's not just romance, you know. And we get to that in a minute. You know, if you pick a narcissist, what does that say about you? But, you know, in work, uh, if you have a business partner or family, how do we recognize the tendencies that are narcissistic, very high, high narcissism uh, and, and those that, we're, that we deal with every day? Believe it or not, um, and I've been doing this for, you know, several, several years. Uh, I tell people to stop looking for it. Stop looking for it. You know, we, you know, people get so obsessed with trying to find out, trying to figure out who the narcissist is, who, who, who isn't. And I tell people to just focus on how people are treating you point blank period. Mm, That's great. Right. How is that person treating you? Does it, you know, does it really matter? Does it really, is it really that big of a deal? I mean, not, not that big of a deal. Let me rephrase. Does it really matter if the person is a narcissist or not, if they're treating you like shit? That's great. Does that matter? Like, it, like, who cares what the title is, right? And the reason why I say that is that there's a lot of other reasons, a lot of other disorders um, that someone might mistreat you. They literally could just be a prick. They could just, 
You know, there's a lot of, you know, people get really fixated on narcissism, but there's so many other, uh, other disorders on that same cluster B spectrum. We have borderline personality disorder. We have uh, socio so antisocial personality disorder, which is, um, so, you know, sociopathy. We have a histrionic personality disorder. Do we really need to continue to date this person or befriend this person and try to figure out which type of disorder, if any, that they might have? Mm. Or can we just say like, you know what, this person mistreats me. I don't like the way I feel when I'm around them and I need to end this relationship. Um, because one of the real, typically we have to understand. And the reason why I say that is that most people who find themselves in narcissistic relationships with, with a narcissist typically struggle with boundaries and yeah. typically struggle with people pleasing behavior and typically struggle with allowing kind of allowing for people to push that envelope far way, way, way too far. And they typically are too overly nurturing, like trying, you know, they will spend years trying to figure out if this person is a narcissist or not. When meanwhile, simultaneously, this person is cheating on them and mistreating and you and using them and wiping out bank accounts. Do we really have to figure all that out? You know, we can sit here and we can say that these things are unacceptable. These things are deal breakers and, you know, decide to move forward rather than, you know, allowing for someone to mistreat us and then wonder if they, and the reality of it is, is that unless, and even if you are someone who is a therapist and can, can diagnose and knows about diagnoses and things like that, you're too close to diagnose anyway. So just focus in on the way that people treat you, focus in on being a good communicator yourself, focus in on uh, setting and understanding what healthy relationships look like. Um, be someone who learns how to build healthy relationships. But the one of the big things, especially if you're developing a new relationship, if it's a whether it's a friendship or um, a romantic relationship, is to go slow. Because the what what narcissism on the surface, it's not that big of a deal. It's a really big deal if you're actually in a relationship with them, when you're sharing a house with them, when you share children with them, when they have access to uh, to things that they can control. Yeah, when it's resources um, and you're like really enmeshed bingo. in life. Yep. When you're enmeshed, it's a really big deal. But the reality of it is, is that you probably run across them, you know, a couple a handful of times per week mm. and you probably don't not notice it's a it's the cashier, it's you know, your boss, it's your coworker. You yeah. know, as long as you're not completely enmeshed, you know, you're, you're typically, typically going to be fine. So if you're early in any type of relationship, I would tell and encourage for you to go take those relationships slow. And if you think about relationships right now, the way that people move at a very quick pace, people are typically moving in within the first year, having kids within the first year, those sorts of things. And then that's, you know, year and a half later, that's when they start to realize, oh my gosh, this person is completely toxic and narcissistic. If people, people would slow down. Um, they would see these things very, very clearly. Man, I, I think it's really cool the way that you kind of uh, redirect the conversation away from the narcissism into our own power, <laughs> which is a great, you know, it's a great kind of poetry there. The, um, the radar for just mistreatment is probably the best thing you can develop because like you yeah. said, it doesn't matter you know, if someone's narcissistic or they they're just they have a shitty fucking life or if yep. they're, you know, antisocial or they kill people and they got them in their basement and they don't want you like whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just how right. how can you um, develop your responses? I love that, Matt, because it puts the it puts the chips back on your side of the table and gives you your power, which says I can, you know, oh, I can walk away from these things. And, yep. you know, the the like the proclivity to want to label people as bad kind of ignores the reality that we we are responsible for the life that we were living and yeah. we want to say like oh they're messed up because they're a narcissist oh that's why our relationship that lasted for three years too long was hell or yeah. you know fill in the blank but deciding that it's my responsibility to to heal so i don't get caught by that if there was Correct. if 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 people healed from um the, the tendency to people please what would happen to the narcissistic tendencies in people would it just kind of disappear they um well they're, they they would find supply somehow somewhere you know but you know if, if there was some sort of magic pill you know and we were to snap our fingers and all people pleasing would stop um you know you might see more narcissistic on narcissistic relationships you know um 
you know, they, you know, they, they would, you know, I'm, I'm sure they would find a way to, to survive. Here's something that's very interesting um, about people pleasing behavior and codependency and that sort of thing. And part of the reason why I circle that kind con- just like you said, I circle that conversation back to the other person in terms of healing. Um, codependency is not the opposite of narcissism. It's the other side of the coin. And a lot of people, that's an uncomfortable conversation that a lot of people don't have. It's a lot of the reason why, you know, um, you know, going back to something I said earlier that there's a lot of misinformation when it comes to narcissism and a lot of the reason why I do focus back on that, that other person healing and, you know, the codependent, um, they have needs that need to be, need to be fulfilled as well. They're looking for a lot of external validation, similar to the narcissist, um, and, uh, like a code, you know, but they, sorry, like, a, like a codependent in the sense, cause the way I understand codependency is like the tendency to take ownership for other people's problems and receive like my sense of validation, being able to fix what they have going on. And that creates this, like that drama triangle of sorts where they're feeling like impeded upon and we feel unappreciated because I'm trying to help you and rah, 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 like that. Right. That's codependency in, in your kind of operating definition. Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly a part of it. And that another, you know, some other parts of it, you know, uh, can be people pleasing can be, you know, uh, the lack of boundaries, um, you know, codependency, again, just like on just like narcissism is, is also on a spectrum. Um, you know, it can um, and uh, people who struggle with people pleasing and uh, codependency also tend to sometimes they can have a lot of these narcissistic traits because of the lack of boundaries. They tend to overly give, whether it be financially, physically, their time, their energy. And once they're depleted, you see this other side of them um, because they're give they're overly giving with the intent of actually receiving something back in yeah. the end. And when they when they're depleted and they still haven't received what they are anticipating as you know love and acceptance, you'll see the other what I call a pop, right, where all of a sudden you see. I don't, after everything I've done for you, right? And all of a sudden, you see this whole other side to them. Wait a second. So the reason why. Wait a second. I wrote down what you said, but I just think I realized what I wrote down. Yeah. Codependency is the other side of the coin of narcissism. Yeah. So, like, my own codependency tendencies are a reflect are like the the same degree of narcissistic tendencies that I have. It's. Yeah, it's yeah. So like the the you know so not opposite, but like the other yeah the other side of it, right? So you're so you have to so with narcissism, the reason why they do the things that they do is for self serving needs, right? Yeah. Um, both the narcissist and the um, and the codependent are like at a deficit, and they're trying to fulfill their needs rather than using self love and healthy coping coping mechanisms. They're actually using other people. So, like you're a, right? you're and, a you're a narcissist at the same degree you're codependent. No, like you're. <clears throat> so the opposite side of the coin. So you're codependent to the extent of like the, you know, maybe like a narcissist that you're with, okay. right? So not not to the same not to the same degree like in the at the same time. Gotcha. I didn't know if that meant that if, cause I have codependent tendencies, I tend to lose the boundaries and assume responsibility for other people's happiness and kind of get my validation by being the hero and that kind of thing. Right. And so mm-hmm. I didn't know if that was like, Oh, that means also you're narcissist. Like that's a narcissistic tendency, but you're saying that I more so fit like a puzzle piece for the narcissist. Bingo. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That makes sense, man. Um, how can we be less, um, how can we be less susceptible to, people pleasing tendencies and really proxying and enforcing our boundaries with people because like we said earlier it doesn't matter why they're mistreating us it's it's mistreatment how can we develop how can people develop our our sense of boundaries and and stability in our independence you have to learn how to become more authentic um we have to understand so people pleasers and i'm a former people pleaser myself and um, I've had to have, you know, a lot of, a lot of people and therapists, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I have a background in therapy. I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a therapist, but a former, I don't practice anymore, but, um, I've, you know, I had access to a lot of mentors and a lot of therapists who, 
they were giving me therapy, but because I knew them, were able to just kind of give it to me straight and like, Matt, we got to cut this people pleasing shit out, mm. you know, and uh, and just give it, you know, give it to me straight rather than like, rather than therapy. Because here's the thing, here's the uncomfortable truth about uh, people pleasing. This is very, <laughs> this is controversial, even though it really shouldn't be. People pleasing is actually a, it's not malicious in intent, but it's a manipulative behavior. And it's an uncomfortable truth that people pleasers need to hear that their that their tendencies to people please is not just being nice as the way that we have like thought of it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's actually very uncomfortable for other people, right? Let's put narcissism aside, but it's yeah. uncomfortable for other people. The reason why it's uncomfortable for other people is that they know what's going to happen if they actually do set a boundary with you. Right. It feels uncomfortable. It feels like rejection. If you, you know, you as a people pleaser, you know, you know what it feels like whenever you were, your, your, um, your not advances, your, um, requests, people pleasing requests yet are denied. Right. Mm -hmm. You feel like, well, you, it's almost like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Like, does this person not like me? Does this person not love me? Do they not want to be friends anymore? Mm -hmm. Do they, um, because you were, you, there was an ulterior motive. You really weren't doing it just to be nice, right? You, there was a need that needed to be fulfilled. You mean like right? I'm scratching, I'm scratching, I'm going out of my way to scratch your back in hopes you scratch my back? Bingo. Yep. Yeah. And you know, um, we we need to learn how. So people pleasers need to learn better, healthier boundaries, right? When I tell people we need to learn them in five different areas, right? Uh, mental or some people call them conversational boundaries, There's certain conversations that I just flat out will not have. Yeah. Right. Period. Online. Maybe I will have them with certain people behind closed doors, the snap, whatever, um, you know, but certain conversations just, you know, or maybe, maybe you just won't have them right, right here, right now. Yeah. People, users might struggle with that because they don't like people mad at them, you know, yeah. that, which kind of gets me, brings me into, um boundary number two we need emotional boundaries it is completely okay for one person to for the person that you're with to be mad or upset and you for you to be com feel completely different than they do yes they don't even just because they're mad or upset doesn't even necessarily mean that they are talking about talking about you you know and so uh and then we need boundary number three which is financial boundaries that speaks for itself need to have limits on how much how much you budget how much you spend how much you're going to spend on your significant other um people pleasers can uh tend to especially when it comes to gift giving and buying and christmas time you know they'll spend their rent money on on a christmas gift and and things like that um and then um we need boundaries around our this kind of goes in, in with uh financial we need boundaries around our um physical or material possessions, mm -hmm. right? Our houses, cars, that sort of thing. We need boundaries when it comes to uh, our physical, um, our physical body. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and let's see. And our time, say, really. Mental, physical, emotional. Yeah, there you go. Time, time slash energy. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's, that's one that I think that people pleasers always, always struggle with. Um, you know, let's say you have a free weekend this upcoming weekend and someone asks you to, but you're also very very exhausted from work or whatever it is that you have going on and someone asks you to help them move yeah well if you don't have the energy right if you're depleted um then the answer really should be no yeah right and it doesn't you know uh, you don't have to have you know just because your time is available doesn't mean that your energy is mm -hmm. you know and those are some things that uh, that people pleasers need to need to learn is how to be authentic and how to be okay with people not being okay with you this I'm definitely a people pleaser in my life, not necessarily as much now as I've learned a lot more about it. And I'm really grateful for that. But it's it's little insights like this that we're talking about now that have like, you know, you learn the same thing twice. But the second time you learn it, actually, like there's 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 perspective and depth to it. You know, you didn't really yeah. get the concept. But the, the idea that if you're if you struggle with people pleasing it's a manipulative tactic your can be i want to i want to i want to kind of clean clean that up because there's and where i said you know earlier when i said it was controversial um 
it can also be a trauma response. Sure. Yeah. So when we, when we grow up, um, when we grow up or if we're in a, uh, situation where we're in danger, where we are, um, you know, people pleasing at some point in time in your life probably got you out of a bad or sticky situation yeah. with someone who was abusive, someone who was harmful, whether it be mentally, physically, emotionally, or whatever the case is. But once we leave those situations, once we're out and once we're safe, just in, and we're just people pleasing, just, you know, get, getting through life. Yeah, our default setting um, now is people pleasing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a, that's a completely, completely different, different scenario. And so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an example because, uh, when, you know, if you, if you ever bring this up to people, you know, there, there's a potential that people might get really upset by this, but let me bring, if you bring what up, uh, people pleasing, being manipulative. Yeah. And let me bring, let me bring some perspective to this. So, uh, people pleasing is a trauma response. Well, so is the fight response, right? Well, guess what? Guess what is underneath the the fight response? It's narcissism. No one's okay with that. You see what I mean? No one's okay with someone just walking through life in their fight res response as as a coping mechanism and mistreating people that way. Yeah. Right. No one is okay with that, and so we have to understand that that like when we bring that type of perspective, like we, no one would no one would say like you bullying somebody else is okay just because it's a trauma response. Yeah. No one is okay with that. Yeah. And in right? the same sense, if you, if so you're, just, yeah, if you go, if you're people pleasing, uh, as a trauma response, even in the later years, it's your adult life now. And you go like, well, it's just because right. this is the way I was treated. You go, well, the response is still something that's antisocial. It's not helpful. This isn't a right. good thing to be doing. It's a, you know, and just because it's not malicious and in intent yeah. doesn't mean that it's not harmful to other people. And doesn't mean that, you know, that, uh, um, other people don't see you as inauthentic because, and, and people who struggle with people pleasing don't see how this can turn off actually healthy people who might want to want a good relationship. With you. Yeah. A hundred percent. you know, maybe it's not always manipulation, but it is always an indirect form of communication. Right. Bingo. Mm -hmm. And that was from, that was for me, what kind of broke that into something that I could digest. Finally, it was like, yeah. yo, the reason when people request things of you, you get an emotional, overwhelming response of obligation is because you feel like if you don't oblige to this, then you can't expect them to do something for you later that you're not necessarily communicating to them is really important and a significant thing because I, don't e I didn't even have the vocabulary to have that kind of conversation. <laughs> but I just knew, I just know that when that, I have known that when that moment comes up and someone requests something of me, I feel like I can't reach for the word no. I can't say no yeah. to them because how the hell am I going to get what I need if I don't just give them anything they want? Right. The boundaries thing is interesting because, like, there's a nuance to understanding boundaries, Matt. Like, you know, it, I like what Henry Cloud says in his book, Boundaries, that a, like a boundary is literally where one person ends and the next person begins. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like a, a no, you can't do that. It's like, that's not yours. And right. what's yours is yours. And what's mine is mine. And in relationship is when we start from that, like a good relationship is where we start from understanding what's our, what's mine and what's yours. And then there's no entitlement to the things you own and vice versa. And we can share intimacy as we actually make requests to pe to each other based on what our needs are. Right. It's such a simpler way to do it too. When you go like, yo, what about instead of trying to take the long route <laughs> to getting your needs met, what if we just felt our needs and communicated with our words to those that we want to get those needs met from? Yep. I tell people, give, give them the answers to the test, mm. right? Just, you know, instead of healthy people, I wouldn't do this if you think you're with a narcissist, but give people the answers to the test, right? Rather than, you know, some indirect way of, you know, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say it like this. And maybe they'll, you know, just, you know, Hey, this is what I was thinking. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting thing, man, that I've sort of noticed in myself in my life recently is that I try to take what I'm going to, what I'm going to tell someone. And I try to consider what they're going to say back and then reiterate, like rewrite what I was going to say to them 
in anticipation of their response. And recently I realized how stupid this was because I'm not even giving them the chance to talk. Like I'm just, mm -hmm. I've already I re rewrote the text three times before I sent it. When I don't even, I just assumed how I thought they respond the first one. I said, of letting them participate in my problem solving of their response that I hypothetically made up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that's cool, man. Um, people pleasing. Any other insights you have on how, how you can, how, anyone who relates to people pleasing can begin to uh, heal in that, in that response. I would read, I would read a lot about it. Um, you, you're going to want to link up with a coach or a therapist um, because I think that it really helps when you're able to role play things out. One of the things that happens um, when people who struggle, struggle with boundaries um you know, you're, you're going to have to get used to people not liking you. You're going to have to get used to people also telling you no. Um, you have to start learning also how to respect other people's boundaries as well, because now that you're going to be a lot more uh, authentic and a lot more direct, you're probably going to hear the word no more often as well. It doesn't mean that they don't like you. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just, it's literally just no, can't, you know, whatever, whatever the case is. But, um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, role playing different scenarios that maybe you haven't been in before really, really helps helps hmm. in those situations. You know, um, having different uh, I, I tell people to have um, have like a, you know, a, a bucket full of like go to like words and phrases of, um, you know, uh, of different things like, uh, you know, in, in different scenarios, like uh, whenever you're setting a boundary. Uh, or vice versa, when someone is setting a, bound, setting a boundary with you, mm. it's oftentimes when we're in the in the heat of the moment and we're not prepared and we don't know what to say that that's when we typically find ourselves getting ourselves in trouble. Yeah, we have no experience. Like the role playing can be really helpful too. It is one yeah. of the one of the reasons is one of the reasons that it's so intense that we get so afraid of somebody not liking us. Is it because it's maybe at some point uh, in the past? we felt like we were abandoned or stopped receiving love because someone made us feel like we were the problem because we had feelings that didn't align with the situation. And so we're afraid to go through that again. It could be. Um, that's, that's one reason. The other reason is um, your boundaries may not have been respected. You know, uh, going back to something that I, I mentioned earlier that um, people pleasing may have gotten you through a traumatic time and people pleasing your trauma you don't let we have to we can't forget that our trauma responses just in and of themselves are really naturally good right they help us in times of trouble well sometimes that trouble is with our actual own parents and there's no one there to save us there's no one else to rescue yeah. us because it's actually their response to their their responsibility to take care of you well people pleasing may have made sure that you know you kept yourself safe from one of your one or both of your parents coming home drunk at night, or, uh, it may have kept you safe in a scenario, um, where, you know, you, you, if you were going to be abused for not fulfilling your parents' needs or wishes, you know, may have kept you safe in, in those scenarios as well. Yeah. Um, but really ultimately if we could rewind and, and the way that it should have happened is that you should have actually been able to give your parents feedback. And your parents should have been able to be the ones to, who respected your boundaries first. And that's how you learn how to set and how, and how to set boundaries and also how people should in a healthy way, respond to your boundaries. Um, but because we didn't have that modeled as a child, people who struggle with people, please them, typically struggle with it into adulthood. And it's one thing that uh, my therapist says that I really like is what was adaptive in childhood is maladaptive in adulthood. And um, yeah, exactly what we're what we're talking about now. What's interesting too is from the perspective of, of a former people pleaser and still some of the effects working through it every day. The it's natural for other people to have boundaries. It's like yep. it's totally normal that they said no. You know, it's totally normal that they like they can do that, but I can't kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's interesting that sometimes I, sometimes I feel that way about people that like. It's almost like other people have the God card. They get to decide what's right or wrong. I don't have the in being in touch with myself and what I'm, what I feel about this, nor do I validate mm -hmm. the way that I feel as a, a valid 
perspective. It's like, how do you feel about this? Is the way I feel right? You know, like, is that how I'm supposed to feel? You know? Um, and then sometimes other times it, it has other time, other times when I've been in relationships that were heavy on the people pleasing side for me, when they set the boundaries, it, it enrages me. Like, how dare you? Like, are you kidding me? After everything that I've done for you and tried to be there for you, you're going to push me out. And that's where I'm, I'm glad that you, you bring that up. That's where it starts to cross over into manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. After everything I've done for you. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, were you doing it because they needed, uh, you know, extra money or were or, or whatever it was that you gave? Or like, was there an anticipation where you like kind of banking things up? Yeah. With the anticipation that when you wanted something from them that you could receive it back. And it's almost you like know, and it's almost like too like you're the inability when someone asks for something and you like you're saying banking it up, you know, like cuz in my 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 experience it hasn't even been intentionally banking it up. It's just been feeling that the obligation is to do for other people even mm -hmm. if you don't want to do it. That's just how you do it. That's just how you do life. And so then when someone else expresses that they they can say no, the thing you can't do, it's like I did things that I hated, did not want to do, didn't have the time and money for, for your ass. And now you won't do that for me. And that just screams like unhealthy relationship. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. And it also makes you, it also makes you a lot more susceptible to someone who's narcissistic. Going back to the original, you know, original theme was, uh, is that someone who's narcissistic they see that and they see that your inability to say no and your in the, your your ability to overgive and to strive for you know um for val for additional validation so what do they do in the beginning they give you a, a lot of validation to get their needs fulfilled you're <clears throat> it's the reason why the beginning of a relationship with a narcissist feels so great so that you're getting the validation they're getting everything that they need but over time they start to take away that validation to try to control you and it actually gets the people pleaser to work harder mm. and that and and so you start working harder well who's the who's the only benefactor of that is the narcissist in that situation yeah something that uh heidi preeb um, says about that fear of abandonment and some of the you know ways to work through that is to practice feeling what you feel and expressing that and detaching from the response that someone else has. And yep. that, that to me has been really, really helpful. And that kind of comes back to that stop. I've really started to stop rewriting text messages and just, yep. and I'm becoming much more able to engage in conflict spontaneously without having to go back to my notebook or whiteboard and think through this whole strategy. <laughs> back to kind of yep. the manipulation thing. Like, because it is, it's like, that's really cool, Matt. You're like going, how can I respond so that I can get a certain response out of them? And that's the, re that's like, dude, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, my guy, f like I've spent probably two years in this just fall apart personality for my, for me, like just some of these breakthroughs that I had started to unravel a lot about my own personality, the way I had constructed it over the years, because I realized that like there's, there was so much inauthenticity to the way that I approach conversation request yeah. negotiation and it's because I'm, i have been scared shitless to just own my needs and express those to other people mm -hmm. and be willing to accept it when they say no yeah one of the what i call it the final boss when it comes to <laughs> people pleasing um the, i would say th this was for me i can't speak for everybody but you have to get okay you have to become okay with people not liking you that's the biggest the biggest hurdle but you have to understand that you know kind of going back to what something you said that other people it's okay for other people to set boundaries well you don't like everybody else so it's just natural that everyone is not going to like you and just because they keep you this is the heart this is what i something that like kind of hit me when i was struggling with people pleasing is that there was a lot of people that kept me around that kept me as a friend only because I was people pleasing, mm. only because I was overly giving and they benefited from that. Yeah. But once I set a proper boundary, I realized that it really wasn't an actual true friendship or relationship. I was literally just being used, but it was really actually my own fault. And so when you start to accept and you start to allow people and, and so 
I, I, people who people who are listening who struggle with people pleasing, I want you to think about this. If you if you start to set boundaries and people start to not like you, they really they probably never did to begin with. Mm, yeah, right. They never did. The whole relationship was inauthentic. It was a fantasy. And so really, you you actually need you actually need and want to know if someone doesn't like you. So then you know how to allocate your time, your energy and everything properly. So then you can actually spend time with people who do appreciate you more authentically. Yeah. So then you have a more genuine relationship. And you can you lose know, yourself. But, but people, people, people who struggle with people pleasing think that everyone has to like them all the time. No. And, and not only is it no, but just because they have you, just like I said before, just because they have you around doesn't mean that they really actually do. And it's like they, there's no way for someone to like you when the version of you that they're interacting with is a false version of yourself. Right. You know, um, something that's really helped me, just a little line of thought has been they're, they're rejecting what you're offering, not you. Yep. That's been really helpful. You know, I own a business. I do a lot of business. I talk to, and that's one of the areas that I've learned that I have, it's been one of the last areas for me to kind of identify and scrape the people pleasing out, mm -hmm. you know, is offering someone something from a job to a certain uh, business oper deal or operation and being afraid that they're going to reject it. And their rejection is a reflection of my worthwhileness as a business person. That's the way I felt. Instead mm -hmm. of instead of kind of getting some of that stickiness off and attaching my identity, who I am as a person and my worth mm -hmm. to uh, detaching that from the thing that I was trying to offer or the suggestion that I'm making. And that's mm -hmm. it feels honestly, man, it feels it feels vulnerable to talk about that, but it also and it also feels really like elementary like those are foundational understandings of how to interact with other people and relationships and how to interpret what people respond to you with and that kind of thing yep absolutely yeah the people pleasing stuff man that's uh it's really cool i love i love the i, I think it's really awesome that the reality is if you're dealing with um really really complex dark mistreatment that why are you still there and the first is mm -hmm. it's the greatest first question to ask you know yeah and a lot i think a lot of people would try to say like well that's victim blaming it's really not um victim blaming what you know you it's victim, victim is it's, it's victim people will say like because you, you'll hear things like you know where the, in situations where the victim will actually be blamed for abuse and mistreatment and things like that um and what what we're talking about is very very different. It's victim empowering. Like after you leave a relationship, things like that. Like you have to put those pieces back together, so then you don't you don't uh, enter into those relationships back. You know, again, and and the only way to do that is to empower yourself. So then you you, you you're able to see it. Yeah. Do you do you feel like um, power follows blame? Uh, what uh, What do you mean? That's the first time I've heard that phrase. Like. Um whatever you blame for the situation or that you're in is what you give the power to that person is that I can see that reason? yeah I can see that yeah I uh, I don't know I, you know I don't know if uh, I believe that in every single situation but I can see that um, I can see that in some in some scenarios yeah yeah and then it's I think it's a helpful distinction too to to use the words fault and verse and responsibility like it's not your fault yep. that that happened but the difficult situation you're in now is your responsibility to deal with. And it's your, yeah. it's your cards, man. It's, you know, what you do with this is going to a hundred percent impact the quality of your life. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Um, a couple other questions I have is I heard someone say one time that social media is training us to be higher on the narcissistic spectrum. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know uh, if it's training us to be higher on the narcissistic spectrum. I think that it's probably exposing people who are already high on, high on the narcissistic spectrum. Um, I think that people, you know, people who are quote unquote being trained to do it because I, I do a lot of people, most people know me for emotional intelligence and toxic relationship stuff, but I also um, 
have a social media marketing agency uh, for law firm owners. And I, but I also help people who are building, building personal brands and things like that. Um, and I, and I've seen it on both ends where someone actually is leans pretty heavily in that narcissism into narcissism. Um, but a lot of people who really aren't feel very uncomfortable putting themselves out there on social media, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on social media. Um, and I, I would also say, be careful about everything that you see on social media. Um, there are some people who might even come across as narcissistic on social media. Um, but then like you meet them behind closed doors and they are nothing like that. Uh, either they're, you know, they're doing it because uh, it's, you know, a character that they play, you know, for, uh, for, what, whatever skits that they do yeah. or whatever, whatever, whatever it is that they post the brand they're building, the um, business they're making, yeah. the product they sell. Mm-hmm. And going back to, going back to something we talked about earlier, you know, a healthy level of narcissism. Um, uh, you know, I, I have a speaking engagement this evening, if, this evening, I, I promise you, I'm going to appear somewhat narcissistic when I go on stage, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we, like we said before, we need a healthy level of it. We wouldn't be able to get through work. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, um, I mean, all, all of the disorders that, that we have are like the healthy, there's a healthy level of, of anxiety. If we didn't have it, your bills probably wouldn't get paid. Your homework probably didn't, wouldn't have gotten done, you know, growing up. Uh, so does it, is it training people to become more narcissistic? Uh, I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, because I think that even though social media is a large part of our life these days, I think there has to be a, a much larger experience and interpersonal experience with old, you know, for there to be some sort of training, especially early on in childhood. Hmm. The last thing that I wanted to ask you before we hopped out of here, do you know the, uh, the Greek mythology story of Narcissus? Mm -hmm. Do you know the end? Have you heard the ending where, you know, the story goes, he leans over to get a drink of water or something out of a river and it, the water so still he can see his own reflection and Narcissus is transfixed by how beautiful he is. And so he just sits there and stares and then eventually, I think just forever goes by and then he falls in, right? He falls in and, and drowns or dies or mm-hmm. whatnot. And then a little Narcissus, yeah. Narcissus flower grows where he was. Mm-hmm. Then some, and then I, the ending is like then uh, a, uh, there was a goddess in the forest that comes out and asks the, asks the body of water, says like, you know, this is where Narcissus stared at himself forever. You got the chance to see him. Tell us, was he beautiful? And then the 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 river responds by saying, I don't know. Only when I looked at him in his eyes, I saw my reflection. That part, that part of the story, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, uh, I don't remember hearing that part of the story, but that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. I've, uh, I've wondered what that means, but I guess today's not the day to discover it. <laughs> <laughs> well uh man look i really appreciate you hopping on here chatting with me a little bit about this uh i love i love i love the theme of taking the focus off a narcissist and putting it into the people and mm-hmm. helping helping other people and helping myself and yourself to recover from some of the uh maladaptive uh practices that we learn in childhood learning boundaries learning to be less people pleasy and uh and be direct with our communication man I, it's really really good stuff thank you thank you very much for having me yeah, absolutely